welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. I'm Susie Friend. I am a board member of WAC, and I will be introducing the first session of this afternoon. Our first speaker of this afternoon is Susan Barger. She uh, is a museum scientist and spent many years in research and education and lives in New Mexico. She found some of the biggest problems facing the museum community was how to assist smaller museums and cultural organizations to improve the care of their collections in cost-effective ways, both for providers and participants in professional development activities. She became involved in small museum outreach almost by accident and over the past two decades has been involved on many levels in addressing methods to provide professional development opportunities to those in smaller institutions. And she really didn't want me to read any of this, so I'm not going to read the rest of it. I'm just going to introduce her talk, Changes in Small Museum Professional Development and Outreach in the Internet Age. Please welcome Susan Barger. Hi, um, so uh, th this is, I, I want to I get you guys to understand what field services are, but I also am kind of posing a question, because where we're going now in field services, n none of us have any idea what the effect is, and so that's kind of what I'm thinking about. So did I make this go? Okay, so this is what the field services manual says about what field services are. But basically, we aim to, to be useful is the motto of field services, who are people that go out and help small museums. Um, and this motto is from 1906, and it still is quite applicable. Um, and I, I never heard of field services and then one day someone said, oh yeah, you, you do field services. And uh, so that's, that's kind of what I've been doing for a long time. But basically what field services organizations do is they provide low cost training. They offer on-site assistance uh, and they provide reliable up-to-date information to smaller institutions. They advocate. So I w at one time was a registered lobbyist so that I could buttonhole uh, legislators in New Mexico. They understand and anticipate the needs of the people they're working with, and they make connections, and they, they, they try to be re respectful. I, because a lot of times we're working with the kind of museums that many of my friends think I'm crazy for working with. They'll say, you know, I was, I was at that place and it's like a drunk store. And I'd say, yeah, and it's a really important institution for that town. So um, that's kind of, and they're, they're field services in all but 11 states. Um, New Mexico doesn't have one. Um, and then there's some regional conservation centers that have offered field services when they've had grant money to do that. There's some independent nonprofit field service organizations, and I ran one in New Mexico until the economy forces to close. Um, internationally, there are people like CCI that do field services, and there's some uh, NGOs like ICROM and UNESCO that provide field services internationally. Um, and it's very expensive because you're sending people out uh, to develop relationships with small institutions. You have to pay for them. You've got to pay for travel and housing, uh, in insurance, overhead, computer stuff. Um, they're the cost for, for offering services. And even if you offer services at no cost, the client institutions have costs if they have to travel. Uh, they may have to stay someplace. Um, and typically, the, they're very hands-on and ongoing because you're working at developing these relationships. And, um, and you've got to have time to raise money and advocate. 
so this is a slide from 2005, and uh, Museum Development Associates was my uh, company that I helped found, and then I ran for six years. Um, and we came out of two IMLS-funded projects in New Mexico. Um, and when the funding ran out from those projects, there was still this huge need, and uh, so we developed, we opened this nonprofit. We were sort of crazy. Um, and so the first program is the left side. Um, I had five museums that applied to be part of this program, and they got one in one training. I saw them every three months. Um, we did workshops. I could require them to do CAP or MAP. Um, they improved their infrastructure, and, and they got to network with, with each other, which is really important. One of, the, one of my museum directors said, you know, I was so happy when I was talking to this other guy because I don't have to chase coyotes out of the museum in the morning. Um, so it was really helpful for them. And, um, and then the Small Museum Development Project, the thing had ballooned to 13 museums. And some of those museums weren't sure why I was coming around. <laughs> And because there, there were people uh, on the state, because I was consulting for the state at that point, who said, you know, I think this museum would be really good. You go there. And so I, I would appear. It wasn't like they wanted me there. And, <laughs> and so, and they'd say, you know, that museum is probably really cute. And uh, so it, it got to be, it, those museums were hard to kind of move along. Um, and the whole idea behind these two projects was to get small museums that normally wouldn't be able to receive traveling exhibits from the state museum to get them so that they could. So that's what these infrastructure imp improvements were for. And, you know, I, I would say, you know, we have to figure out some place in the museum where you could have a hundred linear feet to show an exhibit. Well, you, you've probably all seen these places where they have every single thing in their collection out on display. And there's really no room. And I would have to persuade them that if they wanted to get in, to be in this program and if they wanted to get exhibits, they needed to make some room or figure out if we could make room at the bank or something. So then museum develop, and just to, in, in the time that that ran, I ha worked with 140 museums in New Mexico. We had 30 workshops. There were 250 people that came to the workshops, and I traveled 150,000 miles. And so the Museum Development Associates took up from there, and we had a listserv. We did 800 telephone and email consultations in six years. Um, we did 225 site visits. Um, we worked with the Smithsonian's Museum on Main Street program for two of their rounds. Uh, we published 121 newsletters online. At first, we did a, news, a newsletter every month, <laughs> I mean, every week. And it, it just about killed me. And I, I said to my partner, I said, why don't we just cut back to once a month? And I would go around places, and people would say, you know, you do a fabulous newsletter. And I would say, um, you know, people pay a subscription to get our newsletter. And they would say, oh, they do? <laughs> And I found out that one of the state agencies was taking our newsletter and then sending it to um, 300 institutions. <laughs> and um, so I had a chat with them. And uh, <laughs> they increased what they paid for the, 
method to get the newsletter to $200 a year and still send it out. But, um, and and I, I became a registered lobbyist, which was really interesting. And I did manage to get money out of the legislature, which was also really interesting. But these are, these are some of the pictures of some of the museums that I worked with. Um, the one that you may all know is the UFO Museum in Roswell. Um, and then about 2008, things began to change. Um, we had more and more people saying, can you do things that don't require any money? <laughs> and then they began saying, can you do things where we don't have to travel at all? And it became harder to raise money, except that the USDA had a program to increase internet into rural areas. And all of a sudden, a lot of our people had internet. And that made a huge difference. And high-speed internet, even in you know, tiny, tiny towns in New Mexico. And so we started something called Small Museum Pro, which was an online certification program for people in small museums, where they took five classes, five six-week classes, in a year, and um, they produced a workbook for their museum for each of those classes, and they, they got a certificate from the distance education program at Eastern New Mexico University, and we had 125 people um, in the time that we were running it, um, and they came from the US, from Canada, and England, which really surprised me. And we had nine people who got certified. And that program has now was, we gave it to ASLH, and they now are beginning to run it. So I'm real pleased about that. Um, and other organizations began doing this kind of virtual outreach. So Connecting to Collections Online Community was founded in 2010 by Heritage Preservation. CCI began doing kind of blended training where they would do some internet stuff and some face-to-face. -face. Lyricists began their online training in 2009. ASLH began STEPS in 2009, and they began doing webinars with that. Reorg, which is a, an ICROM program to help people do storage. It's a really neat program. Uh, they began working with CCI to do both hands-on and virtual thing, and a couple of other organizations have done this, and you see it more and more, you know, people do webinars instead of face-to-face -face training. And there is also this new demographics <coughs> in the small museum people. You had uh, places that had fewer and fewer volunteers, um, volunteer staff. They had volunteers, but not staff. You, know, you have to understand that a lot of small museums were run by little old ladies, and those little old ladies are dying, <laughs> and they never were paid any money. And so now there are a lot of, and little old men too, I have to say. Um, now there are a lot of them that are, have kind of two new demographic uh, groups moving in. One is younger staff members, like millennials, people who've had museum training, and, but they didn't have training in cleaning bathrooms or chasing the coyotes out of the buildings in the morning um, or worrying about skunks. <coughs> skunks. Um, and, and who expect to be paid and need to be paid. And the little old ladies that are still alive think that if you pay someone $10,000 a year, they should be pleased. Um, to have a full-time job. Um, and then there are kind of new members of staff that are in their 50s and 60s that have maybe had another life someplace else and they now have gone home to New Mexico or wherever it is and they now want to work in the local museum but they can't afford to volunteer. And so there's this whole shift going on in these smaller institutions of that really benefited from having people that weren't paid to work, but now 
they need to figure out how to get money and how to get training because this new group in the 50s and 60s may have run a bank, um, but they may not have run a museum, and that's a very different thing. Although it really helps to have a banker because they know how to manage money. Um, and I do know some bankers that are now running museums. Um, so FAIC took over connecting to collections in 2014, and it became to, uh, collecting, connecting to collections care. And I, I try to make people not say C2CC because it, um, people have told me it looks like a typo. Um, <laughs> and we're a different program than connecting to collections, although we came out of there. And we're really a virtual field services organization. And our target audience is small and mid-sized institutions. So those people outside the, the profession of conservation. So when a FAIC took over this program, they had all this, these ideas that this would be a good employment opportunity for emerging professionals, that conservators would take these webinars that we were gonna offer to learn new stuff, and I would say, no, 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 no. <laughs> if, if our audience are these small and mid-sized museums, we may have conservators who take our webinars, and that's great, but they're not our target audience. Our tar target audience is out here. And, uh, and that, that was a very hard thing to get across uh, at first. Um, although now I've beaten people so badly. They, um, so we have a, a website. We have about 900 cur curated resources that are for small and mid-sized museums on the website. We have a discussion forum and where people can ask questions and they get answers. And I have emerging professionals who are volunteers, who are monitors. Anisha is one. Or do I have any other ones here? Because, you know, I work with all these disembodied voices. <laughs> um, and then behind the monitors, they're experts. If they're stuck and they need to ask someone, I, I'm always watching what's going on. And I sometimes will say, you know, send a, a note to so and so. <laughs> They'll help you. Um, but I also give them the expert list because the experts have have said, oh yeah, people can ask me. So Jamie is an expert. Do I have any other experts here? I don't think so. Um, and after I begged for a year and a half, because we had you know, 7,000 people that gave us their email addresses, we, and we didn't do anything with them, so now we have a listserv that only does announcements. It, it's not for talking. That's what the discussion forum is for. We've had 43 webinars. I just did one <laughs> uh, since 2015. And we've had 12,400 participants. So remember I was happy that we did had 225. <laughs> now we have this huge number of participants from 38 countries. Um, the largest amount of the foreign people that we have are from Canada. Um, and then I also have to do Facebook and Twitter, which are sort of weird to me, but I do them. Uh, <laughs> we've made a, some formal collaborative relationships with organizations like, we have one with ARCS, the Association of Registrars and Collection Specialists. and. We're going to do some courses soon. We were going to do one this fall, and it, it, we just weren't prepared. Um, and you may have seen that ICROM just did a an internet survey about resources for smaller institutions, and we came up in the top five uh, resources that people access, which I was really amazed because. They sent this out all over the world, and um, you know there we are in the top five. 
So my question is, if you're doing on the ground research it, or, or outreach, it's really time consuming. You have these personal relationships. It's, you reach a rather small group of people directly. And virtual outreach is, you know, I'm at home. <laughs> I run this stuff. It's totally virtual. Um, it is expensive because we, we do have contracts with people. I, I do have an army of volunteers, which I really appreciate. Um, we, we don't really have personal relationships, although people send me messages. And we reach this huge group of people. And I, I just had this conversation with uh, Simon Lambert at uh, CCI, and we're all beginning to wonder, what, what is the effect of this? Do people actually initiate stuff that we do or that we recommend? Do they learn stuff? So if you're on the ground, you can see there's a vis vis uh, visible effect of what, you, what you're doing. And it changes every time there's a change in personnel. So if you get a new director or one of the old ladies dies, um, <laughs> you, you have to rebuild these relationships. Um, Blended outreach, it, it really varies on how, how well people do the internet and then how well they do the, 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 um, the human relationships. And then uh, the virtual, we just get, we've never asked people what the effect is. We get our evaluations and I get lots of, I get notes from people saying, you know, we learned this, this and this and we did this. And in our evaluations, we have notes that say, we love Susan and Mike. Mike is my producer from Learning Times. But we don't know the long-term effect. And this is a really big thing, because the amount of money that goes into producing these virtual things and the amount of push to do virtual um, outreach is, is becoming more and more. So that's what I wanted to talk about. And um, and I'm I'm really interested in talking to people who've done this. Uh, I have a lot of people contacting me saying, "You do really good webinars, and so we we want to know how you do it." So I send them my what I send webinar presenters, um, and because you know webinars really vary, uh, but none of us are sure what the long term effect of this is if people are getting effective professional development or not. So that's what I had to talk about.